with the, the bird streak. Uh, have a number of birds for you today, not so far as Australia. These are all from Washington State. Uh, we have a female red-winged blackbird uh, posing among flowers. You can also see those here in Northfield, though it was mainly spring and summer. But I was seeing them, haven't seen them around lately. Uh, we have the juvenile yellow-headed blackbird. Blackbirds often live in these kind of reed, uh, marshy in environments. That's where I've seen them in town. Another bird that likes to be near water, the least sandpiper. Um, I mean, it may be a small bird, but it just seems like not a very nice name. I would not to be. I would not like being known as least Aaron, for example. Would not be cool. Um, there's a Baird sandpiper, a little bigger, uh, poking around for for food. Uh, and then we have a curious Pacific Slope flycatcher, uh, and then a, a different flycatcher enjoying a tasty snack. So. Few clarifications to start us off. Um, uh, the, to connect to Mantis, which was in the uh, note uh, instructions for Lab Zero, you do need to be on the Carlton VPN for that. Um, I left that out of the instructions initially. That's something that's new this year. They've moved that behind the VPN. Um, there were some questions on the introductory survey about group work, uh, labs zero through three will be individual, labs four and five. Uh, you will have the option of doing them with a partner of your choice or uh, being matched with a partner or doing them uh, by yourself. And VS Code has a great live share extension that's, that's good for collaborating on, on those. Uh, every lab will have a check-in post. So we go to the course web page, look at the calendar, we'll see that lab zero is due a week from today. The check-in post is due Wednesday, so each lab will have this sort of check-in post in the middle. And on the Moodle page, there's a separate form for each lab. And the idea is uh, you get started on the lab, uh, there's some problem that you encountered, something that you figured out that might be useful. Uh, for, for other folks, uh, a question you have about the lab or a question that was inspired by the lab about uh, computer systems generally uh, or responding to a post someone else made. It's a way for uh, all of us to, to work together on the lab. Uh, and the check-in post will be worth 5% of each lab grade. Last clarification, I told you some damnable lies about the quiz. I said that the quiz was on uh, last week's material. It turns out the first 15 minutes of today uh, highly relevant to the quiz. So I apologize if you looked at the quiz this morning and was like, what is this? What is that? Um, all, all we make clear. Um, questions to get us started. All right. So. Sorry, I do have a question. Yes. I had some questions regarding structures from the Lab Zero. Is that something mm -hmm. that will be discussed today, better in office hours? Uh, yes, we'll be talking about arrays and structs and malloc and free, all this, all sorts of stuff relevant to the lab we'll cover today. Okay. Yeah. Why is it necessary to go So I recommend connect, uh, it's not necessary. Uh, I recommend connecting to Mantis because you don't have to install anything besides VS Code. Uh, you don't have to uh, worry as like the compiler doing something. Um, uh, uh, I think you posted on the form that, that GDB, uh, Mac makes getting GDB working a real pain the way it works fine on Mantis. So it just simplifies some setup stuff uh, and it's easy to connect to, so that's why I recommend it. Any other questions? All right, so let's start off talking about arrays. Uh, nope, let's actually start off uh, with a bit of practice. Let me head this up. So, time to arm yourselves once again with the cards. All right, so here's a bit of review on 
uh, Indianness and uh, word size and so on. So I have a hex value here. It's a word on a 64-bit machine. Stored at address 100. Remember, it's the lowest. Uh, uh, the rest of the bytes are at addresses above 100. So take a couple minutes and try and work through what byte is going to be at that address. All right. So some people are hungry, hopefully by lunch, me too. Uh, but we have a, a whole variety of, of thoughts on what's going on here. So please discuss with your neighbors about how this is going to show up in memory. All right, we're still uh, still not in agreement. Uh, so let's work through this. First question. We're told that this quantity is a word on a 64-bit system. So how many bytes does this quantity take up? Yes. Eight. All right, so we're looking at something that's eight bytes. How many bytes is this hex value? Yeah, I see four. So this is four bytes, because every two hex digits is a byte, so byte one, two, three, four. So if this is four bytes, and it's stored as eight bytes, what we actually have is four bytes of zeros, and then A, B, C, D, E, F, 99. And so then we have Big Indian. What does Big Indian say about which byte comes first? Most yeah, the most significant byte. And this is the most significant byte, because it's kind of in the biggest place when we write out this number. Whereas kind of the, the ones is the least significant place. So Big Indian, most significant byte first. We just fill them in. Like so, and so 104 is going to be A, B. Why is the word eight bytes? Uh, so the 64-bit the machine, the 64-bit part is, exact, is telling you what the word size is. Okay. So when we talk about a 32-bit machine or a 64-bit machine, the, the, the number of bits is the word size. That's what that means. Yes? So would you say as a word, is that sort of the same as saying like as a memory address or as a pointer? Exactly, yes. Memory addresses are the number of bytes that's in a word, and so as a word is yeah, exactly the same as that. Yes? Is it possible to store the value as at a size that's smaller than eight bytes, or is, it, is every single data that we store as a word? Uh, no, we, we could store this as a four byte quantity rather than, than an eight byte quantity, or as a six byte quantity, though. Uh, for performance reasons, uh, we like data to be a power of two in, in size. But yeah, we could, we could store this as, as four bytes. I made it a word uh, to make this trickier. What other questions do you have? All right. So we want this and this. It's too big. All right, so let's talk about uh, arrays in C. So an array in C is some number of like the types, some, some number of, of elements that are just laid out in a sort of contiguous chunk of memory, one after the one after the next. So if we uh, in C say int a bracket six, that's declaring an array of six integers called a. So we have 
have the, the type of the elements in the array, and then we're saying this is a fixed size array. There are six integers in there. And so when we look at how that would show up in memory, if I just pick arbitrarily, the array is going to start at address hex 10. This is the same sort of zigzag memory diagram that I talked about on Friday, where uh, we read memory kind of left to right in these rows. If our array A starts at hex 10, and kind of every four bytes from there is one of our integers in the array. So uh, total is 24 four bytes for six integers, uh, and the, the red lines kind of show, show where they are. An important thing to keep in mind about C is that it does no initialization for you of any kind. Meaning that this line that declares this array just sets up the part of memory that's going to contain these six integers. It doesn't do anything to the values stored in that memory. So these 24 bytes will have whatever data happened to be there before it was used for this array. Which means we cannot assume anything about what these array elements, what value they will have, unless we initialize them ourselves. And so kind of good C programming is initialize every value, because otherwise it's just completely undefined what value it might have. So another, uh, so if we, uh, we can index uh, arrays and, and modify them, uh, like uh, you uh, are used to in, in Java or other languages. So if we say a at index 0 equals uh, hex 015f, uh, and if this is a, a little Indian system, our least significant byte comes first. So we have 5f and then 0, 01, 0, 0, 0, 0. We write that there. We can then uh, retrieve that value and set the element index 5 equal to it. Just copy this over here. C does no bounds checking on array index accesses at all. It simply uses the index as an offset, like a number of integers to move from whatever memory address uh, is the start of the array. So we can say the array at index 6. And C's like, well, let's go six integers after the start of the array and you know, just do what you said. Write that integer to that place. And provided that that doesn't overwrite something important and cause a crash or anything, the program continues along just fine. C is just gonna let you do whatever you want, negative, that's just fine. We can go one backwards, uh, one integer backwards from the start of the array and right to there as well. Now, something that's a little surprising about how arrays work in C is that an array variable is essentially no different from a pointer to the first element of the array. And so if we declare some pointer p, it's a pointer to an integer. I pick arbitrarily that it's stored at hex 40. And then these two lines, p equals a, and p equals the address of the first element of a, do exactly the same thing. Because our variable a, our array, is just the address of the first element. And so either of these lines would set the pointer equal to hex 10, the address of where the array starts. And our pointer is 8 bytes. So it would look like this. Yeah? So if you set p, like if you dereference an array variable, it would just give you the value at the zero index? That's exactly right. That if we if we said star a, uh, we would just get the value at the first uh, the of the first element. What other questions do you have? Yeah, um, I'm a little bit confused. So for that one, you put eight zeros in front of A, B, C, D, E, F, nine, nine. For this one, you put all the zeros behind 
the links went zero. So how do you how do you tell that? Yes, so uh, when writing out a hex number like this, I'm just like trying to write the value how we would read a number from left to right. Um, and so this, writing it like this, I'm not thinking about, well, what is, is the system little any or big any? I'm just kind of writing out the number. And I'm figuring out, okay, how are these individual bytes laid out in memory? Then I have to think about big endian means most significant byte comes first. That was the, the practice problem we did. In this example that I have on the screen, it is little endian. So the least significant byte comes first. So if the number is hex 10, 10 is the least significant byte, and all the zeros are in front of it. And so little endian puts 10 first, and then the zeros come after. Yeah? Um, so when you declared the array, you did it with 6. Mm -hmm. um, and then so you did a, a negative 6, negative 1. So you can access the bytes before and after the array. Did you do a of 7, did bracket 7? Yes, the, uh, that's exactly right. We can, C is not checking that our memory access is within the bounds of the array. All it's doing is A is the memory address at the start of the array, and then our index tells us like how many integers worth of memory to move from the start of the array. So we can move six kind of up in memory or negative one back in memory, and yeah, we can, we can write data there. And maybe this will overwrite something crucial and it will cause the program to crash. Maybe it will change the value of some other variable. Maybe it will be fine. Uh, we don't know. It depends on how memory is laid out. And so this is kind of the, the downside of working in a language that kind of gets out of your way and lets you do whatever you want with memory. Whatever you want could be you know, a bad idea. So then, Sorry, go ahead. Um, so A bracket, you want to four bits. Yeah, so that would move one integer's worth back from the start, so you have four bytes back. Yes? I'm a little confused in like, where the code is, so where the address is, where the array will go, and like, yeah, like, where the address is. Yes, that's a great question. There, there's nothing in the code that says where this stuff will go. That's just up to the compiler slash operating system. So for the sake of the example, I just have to pick places, but they, yeah, they could be wherever the system puts them. Yes. So that would be the same logic to put one through P as of OX40. It's just like you decided it's going to put it there. But actually, the computer is going to put like somewhere. So. Exactly. In my role is like the system in this example, I chose hex 40. But exactly. The, the system will put it somewhere. I imagine this is probably something for a later date, but in terms of like collision checking of like whether or not an array overlaps with something else in your program, are there like easy ways to do that? Or is that like when you say overwriting something important, if you create a new point, like create a new array and have that initial pointer, is there a way to understand whether or not something within that range will have data you can't write? Mm -hmm. So um, if the compiler were to create this array overwriting some other data that our code had declared, the compiler would just be screwing us over. Um, so in general, the compiler does not do this. Um, and this is why certainly in older versions of C, you could only declare arrays with like fixed, like a literal number as the size, because the size had to be known at compile time, so the compiler could make sure the different values of memory were going to be trying to use the same space. Modern compilers are more sophisticated. They can handle dynamically sized arrays. It involves a little more computation, but it's, uh, it, it can do it. But yes, we, we will trust the compiler not to just like mash all our data together. Other questions? All right, so let's talk about C strings. Uh, C strings are uh, a special kind of array. They're just an array of characters. So each character, one byte, integer, 
And uh, if I look up, or if I bring up a terminal and run man ASCII, man is short for manual, it's going to show me first octal, which I don't care, uh, and then hexadecimal, it's going to show me the hexadecimal value that corresponds to each of the 200 and, um, well, up to 255. There aren't actually that, that many in this standard. Uh, what number corresponds to each character? So hex 21 is the exclamation point. Hex 43 is capital C. Um, and this also here has the, the decimal um, versions as well. Uh, you can also Google ASCII table and, and there's uh, a, a version in the notes posted for today, uh, but this is this um, encoding, this corresponds between some integer that, that the char value stores and the text character that it represents. And so when I say something like, all right, here's an array of characters, that's how I represent a string, and then I initialize it to some text string, a very excited hello, then uh, it's, again, I'm just picking arbitrarily as the compiler, it's gonna be a hex 30. Uh, and then each of these uh, individual characters will be written here. And this is uh, a key point. When we're talking about big and little Indian, this only matters for the bytes within a single quantity. So within a four byte unit or an eight byte pointer. An array is a bunch of separate quantities that are just like put in the same region of memory. And so the order of the array elements is always like the one index zero, then index one, then index two. That is not affected by bigger little Indian. That just means that we're going to have H, I, and four, four exclamation points. So my H is 68, my I is 69, and the exclamation point is 21. There are four of those. So here's a question. We have these six bytes of this string in memory. And this is, this is what we have in memory. There's no like extra information about the size of this array or anything. That's not something C keeps track of. Uh, how would we know that it's these six characters that make up this string? Is there anything that to tell the system like it's these six six bytes? Yeah. Exactly. That there is nothing to tell it as I've written it here. We need some like some signpost, some marker, some something that comes at the end that is going to tell us this is the end of this string. And uh, this is something called. The null terminator—it's a byte that is zero to zero. It marks the end of the string. It's how the system knows that that reached the end of the string. If we want to write it as a character, characters are written with single quotes in C, and we have backslash zero. This is how we write that uh, as a character. And so when our system initializes the string, uh, it will put in this null terminator, this zero byte at the end, so that uh, when, say, we go to print out this string, the system knows after it uh, reads the fourth exclamation point, it hits this null terminator and knows to stop. That null terminator was not there, it would just keep going until it happened to hit a byte that was zero, because that's the only way it knows how to stop. Yes? Isn't that still the same as if it's like in the number? Like, can, can that still be encoded as, say, like a um, so we have just like the the system the designers of this uh, of C have just chosen that a character value of zero indicates the end of the string. So we have just said okay zero zero is special, uh, and that's going to be the end of a, of a string. If we look at our ASCII chart. Like zero zero is this null, um, and the the digit zero is actually hex thirty. Is how we would indicate like the text of 
a num uh, number zero. Does that make sense? Questions? So those like in, in that uh, long string of what well, string, that long uh, number you've got there, those zeros are the numeric zero and not the, the null zero. Uh, so a byte that is all zeros, all eight bits are zero, which we would write as hex zero zero. Uh, it's the same. Like the null terminator is just a byte that is all zeros. And so for the purposes of an, if, if we tell the system, if we interpret the value in memory starting here as a string, when we're interpret, it will go through the bytes starting there until it hits a zero. Because that's like what we've set up is like this is the special marker for the end of a string. Okay, but, not, but not for like an array of any, like an array of integers. That's right. This is particular just to interpret interpreting strings. Yes? When you were in response to the array, the array is now size. So, what is that like an empty size or that's still fixed size to be where yeah, so this code that I wrote here to initialize the string, I didn't have a size uh, because the string literal, the high with four exclamation points, that determines the fixed size of seven by six for the characters, one to the null terminator. If I wasn't initializing the array to a specific string, I then would need to provide a size because it then couldn't infer the size from, from the string. Does that make sense? Perhaps? Uh, do you know why they didn't have arrays end with a null terminator? Sorry, arrays is it? Yeah. Um, so this is, there, uh, why don't arrays also have this null terminator? Um, so one, uh, one thing is that a null terminator can be like one byte of zeros for an array of characters. So an array of integers doesn't need to be four bytes of zeros or is, is one enough. Um, for an array of other things, for an array of integers, we want to actually be able to represent the number zero rather than using hex 30 as the numeral zero. So all zeros then doesn't make, maybe doesn't work as like indicating the integer. So it, it turns out it's like easy to do this with strings and kind of hard to figure out how to do it with other arrays. The way Java does this is it just separately keeps track of the, the size of all arrays uh, and uses that to check is the index out of bounds um, and see created in, a, in an era where memory was much more constrained, didn't want to always be keeping the size around, um, and so kind of went for this trade-off of lower memory use, but maybe you can do array accesses that, that are sad. Yeah? I'm confused on the difference between the zeros on the example you have on the board and on the screen, because you said that that's like word also, so and there's zero before, so how did the no difference between you know, those zeros and the null terminator zero? Um, so in terms of the bits in memory, there is no difference between the null terminator zero and the zeros in, in a number. It's just a byte where all eight bits are, are zero. So. As we'll see again and again in this course, what determines whether it matters is not what's in memory, it's how we're interpreting the values in memory. So when we interpret something as a number, we see something that's all zeros as a zero in the larger number. When we interpret something as a string, we see a byte that's all zeros as a null term. But in terms of what's actually in memory, it's the same. And so it's whatever the, the program is interpreting the, the bytes in memory as that, that determines it. Does that make sense? So a word is a separate thing, a string, like a separate story. Yeah, a, a word is just um, an amount of memory. And on a 64-bit system, a word is eight bytes. On a 32-bit system, a word is four bytes. So yeah, a word is a, a measurement of an amount of memory. Yeah. Um, this goes back to what you're saying, but um, could you explain um, how we get one zero uh, and the rest of mm -hmm. zeros um, by looking at the code or something? So 
That's uh, how do I how do I know that, that this is going to be ten with a bunch of zeros? Um, so in these lines, I am setting this pointer p equal to the memory address of the first element of the array. And so I had previously chosen that the array was going to start at hex 10. And so p will have that address as its value, hex 10. And since we are, and since it's a memory address on a 64-bit system, it's going to be 8 bytes in size. That's how I, I know how big it is. And then this is a little endian system, which is how I know that the least significant byte, the 10, comes first, and then all the, and then the rest of them are, are zeros. Does that make sense? So it's like saying the ad, like it's kind of like storing the address instead of the, the actual uh, number. That exactly. If P is a, a pointer, it's storing the address of some other thing in memory. Yeah. Uh, does does little ending or big ending affect the order of, of uh, characters in a string or, or any other array? Uh, it does not. So uh, ending only affects the bytes within a single quantity, so within an integer, within a pointer. Uh, but an array is a bunch of separate uh, elements that are just like in the same region of memory. So in our array of integers, index 0 comes first, then index 1, then index 2. Same with our string. First character, second character, third character. So endiness does not affect the order of array elements, only the bytes within an individual element. Uh, does that make sense? All right. So. Uh, We've seen uh, arrays and strings. Uh, C, as, as bare bones as it may seem, does provide a standard library. I think it's here. Nope. Nope. If we go to, yes, there we go. Uh, there's a website, uh, perhaps deceptively named c++.com. This is my, my preferred reference for both C++ and C, because uh, it turns out you can use C in C++, so I guess that counts. Uh, but if you go to c++.com, go to reference, and this a little bigger, uh, you'll then see all the, the kind of different components in the C standard library. Um, uh, Right now, we are interested in uh, the string library. And there are a number of kind of useful functions that are provided by this um, for uh, doing things with string. Uh, one that you will use in lab zero is strlen, which takes in a string and returns the number of characters uh, in that string. It's just looping over them until it hits a null terminator. So it's just saving you from having to, to write that, that loop yourself. Um, there's also functions to um, copy strings from kind of one to uh, the stir copy, stir and copy um, that I will, I will demonstrate in a moment. But this uh, c++.com I wanted to, to note is a, a useful resource. So the other kind of data uh, that uh, we need to talk about um, is structs. So C does not have um, uh, any uh, objects. All we can do is group uh, some number of values together in what's called a struct. So for this, I'm going to use VS Code to uh, connect to, to Mantis to, to write some code. And so uh, I have in the extensions, uh, I have the uh, remote SSH extension installed, which is uh, what lets VS Code do this. I go down to this lower left, brings up this menu, connect to host. I previously added the, the Mantis host. There are instructions on, on how to add this in the, the notes from Friday. 
I click on that, it uh, opens up a window, um, and now I have uh, a, a terminal on Mantis, and I can open open files and edit them on Mantis, uh, all of that. So I will go ahead and actually use the terminal, which terminals are always located in a particular uh, directory on the system, and I can see what that is with print working directory, pwd, shows that I'm in slash account slash awd, my home directory, it's named for my, my username, and I can use ls to list all the, the files that are in my home directory. And then I can use cd for change directory to move between them. So I'm gonna move into uh, documents and then cs208. I'm going to make a directory f21. I'm going to go into there and then I will uh, open, go to open folder and open that folder in VS Code. Yes, I trust me. So, if I create a file, call it structs.c, and uh, C code uh, always has to, like Java has a main method as part of an object, C doesn't have objects, just functions, so we can say, uh, int main is our kind of main function where the code will, will start. And I said I wanted to talk about structs. They're just ways to group multiple pieces of data together. So lab zero asks you to implement a linked list. So if I wanted to declare a list element struct, I would say struct, and then I give the struct some name, and then uh, curly braces, and it would need to end in a semicolon. So what, what do we need, what might we want inside a linked list element? Yeah. Yeah, we want some value. Uh, in this lab, it's going to be a string, and strings are uh, uh, arrays of characters, and arrays are just pointers to the first element of the string. And since we don't know ahead of time how many characters are going to be in each uh, uh, node of our list, we could choose some fixed limit and declare some fixed size array here. Like we could say, uh, all right, every list element is going to have uh, uh, up to 100 characters for a string, and anything more than that, it's gonna just break. Uh, I prefer not to just choose this arbitrary element and if all the strings are short, I'm wasting a whole bunch of, of bytes by making everyone 100. So instead, I'll just make it a pointer and I will like set up the memory for the string as, as we go. And we'll, we'll see how that works in a moment. Uh, what else do we need inside a linked list? Yeah. Yeah, uh, some reference to the next node in the list. Uh, and in this case, it's a pointer to another list element struct. And to write down the type of, of a struct, I have to say struct and then the name that I give the struct. I'm also going to have a struct for the queue that uh, we're implementing in lab zero. Uh, and it's just going to have a pointer to the head of the linked list. Questions so far? Yes. Um, I think uh, when I was doing the lab, there was, uh, after the struct, there was a list of the team. So, uh, I don't know about you, but I would find it kind of annoying to have to, to write out this struct list ella everywhere, particularly if it's if I'm gonna do it a lot, it's kind of cumbersome. And so C provides a way to rename some type as something else. So it's just like giving a type another name that I can use instead that is maybe more convenient. And what the, the starter code does is it says type def, which is the special uh, keyword to do this 
uh, giving a type another name. And so type def, here's this whole list Ella type, and I'm going to type def it as list Ella T. And so now instead of struct list Ella, I can use this other name that I have given it. Questions? When you have struct list um, L in under the scope, is it because list LT hasn't been defined yet? So we, okay. Yes, that's exactly right. I, I couldn't use list LT inside here because this whole thing is what is defining list so LT. That's just saying that's like a noted on each list. So mm -hmm. list LT is that. Uh, could you clarify what the queue is? So is it storing just a bunch of linked lists? And the way we get is by having a node that is head kind of representing the beginning of each linked list? Um, yes, so the eraser always The way that we set this up is we have our queue, and this is kind of what some program will have as like if it has creates a linked list, it will have a reference to this queue struct. And then the queue just has a pointer to the first node in the linked list. So then we would have Oh, so the queue isn't storing multiple linked lists, it's just storing one linked list. That's right. It's just storing a reference to the start of some. Okay. Yeah. So is the reason we would want the queue because the head of the linked list might change at some point? Like what's the why would we want like a separate queue to store? Or is this just like the object of the list as a whole instead of what the individual? Um, so that's a fair point. We wouldn't have to design it with this separate queue structure. We could just have the first node in the list and have this head be some separate variable. But what if we want to insert things at that? Now the thing that's the start of the head has changed, and this really complicates it unless we have this sort of separate thing that can keep track of, of the head. Yeah. So what exactly is List that just call back to the first function and then have it elsewhere? Yeah, so, so list LAT is just another name we can use instead of struct list alpha. So it just lets me use it here and, and anywhere else that I would in, in my program, such as if I wanted to, uh, I could say list LAT uh, node to just like declare, declare a node. Um, and to access uh, fields within a struct, I use uh, a dot like you uh, uh, would, in, would to access uh, fields of an object in Java. So I would say node.value equals I'm just a humble node. And node.next is capital um, null. So there's capital null. is just the value zero, but it is specifically a zero that's a type of a pointer. Uh, and so it's just a little nicer way to, to write down a, a pointer that doesn't have a value. Uh, null is actually not built in. It's part of the standard library. And so I would need to say um, pound include standard lib.h in order to get access to all the things in uh, standard yes. Um, what's the difference between a dot and an arrow? Yes, so there are, there's different syntax for uh, accessing the fields of a struct if what you have is the struct itself or a pointer to the struct. Uh, so let me, let me write a bit more code and we'll see that in action. So I can then say uh, struct q q q.head is address of node. I, I use the ampersand because this head is a pointer to a node. And this node is, it's not a pointer, it's the actual list LAT. And so I need to generate a pointer to the node 
uh, to assign something to this deletive. Sorry, can you clarify? Because there's also an ampersand in front of the value in the next. And there's a star in front of value in the next. So I read those not addresses. Uh, so, so value and next are in also both pointers. Uh, and so node.value is, will have, um, will be the address of the, the first character in the array as a result of this. And null is this, uh, uh, is like the value zero as a memory address, is like what null is doing for us. Um, and to get to your question about uh, dots versus arrows, if I have another list LAT, uh, maybe I'll call it second. Then I would say Q dot head to access the head field of the Q. Head is a pointer. So I can't just say dot next equals second because a list LAT pointer doesn't have a dot next. So one thing I could do is dereference the head pointer and then say dot next. This is really annoying. So instead what I will do is use the arrow operator. And all this error operator is doing is dereferencing the pointer and then applying the dot. And it's just a much nicer way uh, to write that. And so you, you use the arrow when the thing you have is a pointer to the struct. What are your questions on this? All right, let's do a bit of practice. Which of these types would you use for an array of three strings? All right, let's see our best guess on the type for an array of three strings. All right, please discuss with your neighbors how you're thinking about the type of array. All right. Yes, our, we are converging on, indeed, how we would write down an array of three strings. We have the variable name string r. Before that, we have the type of thing in the array. A string is a pointer to a character, uh, the address of the first character in our array of characters. And then the brackets three says, okay, we're going to have an array of three pointers, each one pointing to uh, a string. Yes? How would you write it if you wanted to define the strings as being like length 100, for example? So that would be a um, two-dimensional array, which we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, but you could say something like, and have three by a hundred of a two-dimensional array. But we'll, we'll get to two-dimensional arrays later. So yeah. what would this be if the star wasn't there? If we just okay. had um, yeah. char string array three, yeah. so like the, the first one, yeah. that would be an array of three characters rather than three pointers to a character. So it would be like just three individual letters in the array rather than... Oh, so um, I missed the question. The array of three strings can... Strings here are pointers. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> uh, a, a, in C, a string is an array of characters. In C, an array is a pointer to the first element of the array. Therefore, a string is a pointer to the first character in the array. Yeah. Well, there's one more string argument to that. Does that actually initialize the third character to the 
No. Nope. So why do you actually need to list how long it is? Um, so, so here we're, we're creating a three byte array um, rather that is uninitialized rather than initializing it to some specific string. Would be the, the is, is that what you're? I'm just saying, why do you have to define the length at all? Like, like, like there's, no, there's nothing that says that it's only too long because that's an alternative array. Right? So, what we're doing there is we're, at, we're telling the compiler set aside three bytes yeah. to store this. Uh, the compiler is not willing to set, a, set aside an unspecified number of bytes. So, you just are not able to declare an array gotcha. that doesn't have a size. <laughs> yes? So we've kind of gone over what A and C would be. Do you mind saying what B and D would be if we wrote them that way? Yeah, so B would just be a single pointer to a character. It would just be a single string. It's not actually an array at all. Um, and D is an array, uh, still an array of three pointers. But we're saying that these pointers are pointers to pointers to characters. So D is not something I would ever expect to see. Like, doesn't, like it's a thing that you can do, I just don't know why you would do it. Um, it's setting up this like extra level of uh, kind of pointer following for uh, unclear, unclear benefit. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess I'm just like, you said for B that it's, it's to a string not an array. Aren't strings like also technically char arrays? Yeah, so it's, it's, it's like a nomenclature thing. Um, I'm saying that, that B sets up a single pointer rather than an array. Like, yeah. So, just to repeat what like, you're saying, so C is a list of three pointers, and each pointer would go to a string. Exactly. It, it initializes an, an array where each of these is an eight byte char star. And then each of them could be, you could set them up to point to the first character in some array of characters. Point to the string. But there's uh, one example I, uh, I'd like to, to work through, since I think it will be very helpful as you work on lab zero. And for this, I'm going to use pythontutor.com which, despite its name, uh, can visualize a number of different languages. So I go to the, the C tutor part, and I'm going to go over to my code before and copy these in. And I will then say, all right, we're going to have a, uh, a Q, which I'll call Q. And I'll set the head equal to null. And then I'm just going to set up a string using a new, uh, uh, a new kind of thing that, that we haven't talked about in C yet. Uh, and uh, this malloc function, short for memory allocate, is a way to ask the system to set up some chunk of memory of a specific number of bytes um, that's in a region of memory called the heap. And uh, we'll see through this example um, why we need the heap in order to be able to, to do something like what we want to do in lab zero. After we set up uh, the Q, um, we will uh, then use the uh, string copy uh, library function to copy 2s the string fungi. String copy has the destination first and then the source that you're copying it to. So I set up this chunk of, of 30 bytes for s, and then I'm copying a string over to it. I will need to include uh, string.h to be able to use string copy. And then I'm going to call my qAdd function with my q 
and string s. So I'll implement that. It does not return anything. It takes in a uh, struct q and r star s. And it's going to add a node to the head of the list. So we saw before list lt node node.next is null. The node's value I'll set equal to my string s. And then I'll set the head equal to the address of the node. And then I'll also add a second, I'll copy balloon to my string s and then add that to the queue. And so I'll need to account uh, if there's already a head to the queue, then the new head needs to refer to. What is the end? Uh, n is supposed to be node. Thank you. So if I then click visualize execution, it will attempt to compile. And then it's going to show me a, a nice visualization of kind of what's going on in memory as I step through the code line by line. So my queue, it has a head field, set that to null. When I call malloc, I create this array of, of 30 characters that is telling me is over in the heap instead of on, this, on the stack. I copy fungi, which includes the null terminator over to the string. Then go into queue add. And now I see here, here are all the local variables to my call to the qAdd function. And uh, you'll notice that there's a separate queue here. That what this did is actually copy my queue is into the, uh, a local variable to this function, which means as I set this all up with the, the nodes value equal to that, that string, I change this queue, but when the function returns, this all gets thrown away. Local variables of a function get thrown away once the function returns. So the way I've written queue out here literally does nothing to modify the queue because I'm just copying the queue struct when I, when I pass it in. So that's no good. Let's do this better. And instead, let's pass in a pointer to the queue so that we actually modify, modify the queue rather than, than copying it. Now it's telling me, well, you can't use dot with a pointer. And now that Q is a pointer, you need to change these all to arrows to access and modify the field of a, a struct that I have a pointer to. And all the different versions of this QAD function that I'm going through are all written out in the notes. Um, so you'll, you'll be able to refer to them. Uh, and there's a link from the Lab Zero handout to this full example on Python Tutor as well. Uh, but now that we have this better version of QAD, we see that, okay, the Q in the QAD is actually a pointer to the Q struct that I set up in main. So that's an improvement. Um, set the node equal to here. When I modify the queue's head, I follow that pointer. I modify the head to point to the node that I've created. But I still have the problem where once I return, that node that I created as a local variable function gets thrown away and my head pointer is, is crap. So putting the new node on the stack where it's going to get automatically thrown away at the end of the function is just I cannot add a node to uh, to the queue that way. And so this is where this malloc creating memory on the heap, where instead of the system automatically creating it and destroying it, I as the programmer am manually creating memory on the heap with malloc and destroying it with uh, the corresponding function free. 
I can, instead of doing this list L node like this, it's going to be a pointer. I'm going to set it equal to malloking some number of bytes. So I need to malloc enough space for my actual node struct. Fortunately, I don't have to figure that out. I can just ask size of list LT. And if you use size of with some type, it's going to return the number of bytes that that type takes. So now node is a pointer. So I'm going to change all the node dot to node arrow. And uh, this should be a big improvement. Oh, yes, that's going to be not what we want. Good catch. That would have set Q equal to the, uh, the head equal to the address of, again, my local variable that's a pointer. So that would have, would have undone my, my whole attempt. So now malloc puts my new list node over on the heap instead of where it was in the stack before. I set its value to point to my string s and set the head to point to this thing on the heap. So now when my function returns, my node is still here. It has a, it, its value is pointing to this array. Life is good. And then I reuse the same array for the next string I want to add. And the string that my node was pointing to just changed out from under it, got changed to balloon. And there was nothing like preserving the fact that fungi was the first string that I added uh, to the list. And so if I add the second node, I just end up with two nodes that both refer to the same string on, on the heap. So the final version of this is one where not only do we create memory on the heap for the node, we create memory on the heap for the string as well. And so each time we add a string to our list, we're copying the string over to kind of preserve it as, as we add more. So value instead, we would malloc something that's the length of the string s plus one for the null terminator, because Sterling does not count for null terminator. Uh, and then we could use stir copy and the safer version stir n copy. We're copying to node.value from s a number of bytes that is the string length plus one. So this is the final version that will actually do the full, like each node gets its own copy of the string. Out of time, I encourage you to uh, review these examples on your own um, uh, to, to make sure you understand how it's working. Uh, I have office hours tomorrow evening and all in 310. And otherwise, I'll see you on Wednesday.